The following lecture is a PowerPoint presentation that I gave in the April Northeast Victorian Studies Association Conference um, in 2013. Uh, the title uh, was Richard Proctor's Sense of Scientific Duty in the 1874 Transit of Venus. Um, the theme for the NAVSA conference was 1874. Uh, so as somebody who has given uh, Transit of Venus lectures before, I uh, gotten quite lucky as someone who studies literature and science. So, here goes. In the May 1873 notices of the Royal Astronomical Society, the scientific popularizer and fellow of the Royal Astronomical Society, Richard Proctor, wrote an embarrassing open letter to his American peers, asking that if England were not willing to set up a transit of Venus observatory in Antarctica, or the very southern reaches of the Indian Ocean at least, then would the Americans please take on the task? Science, he says in a second-hand quote from Humboldt, is of no country. America has frequently shown great interest in southern exploration, while she also possesses good telescopes and competent observers to use them. Let both countries do their best, and science, which is of no country, will benefit all the more. I gladly act upon this suggestion, remarking only that while I recognize the abstract justice of the proposition that science is of no country, I cannot altogether free myself from the hope which I have long entertained and expressed, that in the struggle to advance scientific knowledge, this country may worthily maintain her position. This letter had been preceded by a years-long exchange between Proctor and George Biddle Airy, the astronomer Royal. In 1857, Airy had performed some preliminary calculations to determine the best locations for viewing the 1874 and 1882 transits of Venus, and had come up with a list of sites and some determinations about methodology. Proctor disagreed vehemently with both of Airy's choices. That this disagreement would be total was unavoidable, because determinations about methodology, with respect to transits of Venus, are closely tied up with determinations about observing sites. Firstly, the transit can never be seen on the entire globe, and the visibility zones change from event to event. Secondly, Within those visibility zones, the choice of observation sites depends on the method of observation being employed. One can either adopt the method proposed by Edmund Haley in 1716, or that proposed by Joseph Nicholas de Lisle. The purpose of transits of Venus is to measure the difference between the Sun and the Earth, and this is achieved by parallax measurements. Transits of Venus occur, on average, every 110 years, and then again eight years later, and then an average of 110, when Venus crosses between the Sun and the Earth. Venus is close enough to the Earth that it has an observable parallax effect. Depending on your longitude, contacts between the Sun and Venus happen at different times. And depending on your latitude, the trip across the Sun has different durations. In 1716, Edmund Haley proposed a method of using the differences in duration to calculate the distance between the Sun and the Earth. If observers at maximally distant latitudes measured the duration of the transit of Venus across the Sun's face, then they would be able to accurately calculate the parallax of Venus on the Sun, and so determine how large the Earth looked from the perspective of an imaginary viewer on the Sun. Halley's method had been widely deployed during the transits of 1761 and 1769. Airy had settled on a different method, however, one which had been suggested by the French mathematician de Lisle. Halley's near contemporary. Under Delisle's method, the parallax is determined not by measuring differences in duration, but rather differences in the precise time of contact. This method has the advantage of being less susceptible to bad weather because you only need to view one contact rather than two. It has the technological disadvantage of requiring a very precise determination of each observatory's longitude. This determination is the original problem of positional astronomy. But Airy believed that enough te technical progress had been made for determinations of longitude within, a, within at least a second, and that this, coupled with the visibility zones, made Delisle's method feasible and preferable to Halley's for 1874. His math, however, was wrong, and the differences in durations at different latitudes were much greater than he thought. Proctor noticed this error early on, and suggested to the Royal Astronomical Society in 1869 that corrected calculations made Halley's method just as feasible as Delisle's, and that other sites than the ones proposed by Airy would be preferable. Different methodologies here 
mean vastly different strategies in order to secure the right equipment, train the observers properly, and make all the necessary political arrangements to establish observatories in different areas of the Indian Ocean, which was, of course, contested colonial space. I want to draw out two strains of an internationalist scientific ethic bound up in the two astronomers' preference for Delisle, or Haley, ultimately in order to understand the stakes of institutional self-critique at play in Victorian astronomy. Proctor's argument in favor of the Hellean method necessitates international cooperation, but in a very conservative manner that does not destabilize the categories of the nation or of empire. In order for Halian observatories to be effective, stations must be established at sufficiently distant latitudes. And when Proctor gives, argues that England should occupy distant southern stations, he frames it as a question of different nations in their different territories, making complementary and mutually dependent observations. Everybody owns their own space, essentially. The Russian station at Nurchinsk Mines is a situation in which nothing but an amazing zeal in the cause of science could induce any astronomer to select as an observing station in December, since it lies close to the northern pole of winter cold. It lies, in fact, on the isocomino line of 13 degrees Fahrenheit below zero. But because it is the very best northern station for applying Halley's method, Russia has nobly undertaken to occupy it. There are corresponding southern stations, which this country could occupy, if not less zealous than Russia in the case of science. Russia is doing its part for science in its own part of the world, and England should do its part in the inhospitable regions that it had long proved itself so capable of exploring and of colonizing. In other words, Proctor is nationalistic, even in his internationalism. In a more popular article written three months later, Proctor implies that it might make more sense for the Americans to occupy Possession Island, given that England probably didn't have what it takes anymore. Of the duty of Great Britain in this matter, I have spoken earnestly because I feel warmly. Viewing the matter as an Englishman, I may say that I should feel concerned if this duty, neglected thus far by us, should be undertaken by America, the country to which, next after us, the duty belongs. But viewing the matter as a student of science, my great wish is to see due advantage taken of the great opportunity afforded by the approaching transit, without specially caring whether this country or another obtain more honor in accomplishing the task. It's important to note that Proctor's competing allegiances here, between international science and national pride, are asymmetrically aligned. Britain's success will please him, but the success of international astronomy will merely protect him against disappointment in the event of his country's failure. Scientific dispassion, for Proctor, is a very real and valuable thing. Its negative effective potential offers him a way out of the personally and politically fraught space he has created by raising his objections to national scientific policy on the, on the public and international stages. He's acting like a modern-day whistleblower, in fact. Compared with Proctor's internationalism, which treats nations as stable entities with defined and geographically determinate responsibilities in a global scientific community, Aries' understanding of international scientific cooperation is a complex one. It is true that Aries' chosen method relies directly on international support because it needs no north-south complementarity between stations, but importantly, Airy does not make Proctor's assumption that the observer nations will have exclusive occupancy of the various sites. Consider the case of Kerguelen. The island is in the South Pacific, and the British set up three stations there. Indeed, the astronomical equipment on the island is somewhat overkill, given that the expedition was outfitted for two stations, one of which was to sail to Heard Island in the south, but they were warned off by a seal hunting vessel that conditions on the islands made it uninhabitable, even for zealous astronomers. But also on the island were German and American observers, each at their own stations. And in the process of determining the precise longitude of the island's stations, the British included their foreign counterparts. They set off gunpowder charges on a hill near three of the stations in order to determine the observed differences in time and to correct their clocks accordingly. The Americans repeated these signals at intervals to the second British station with gunshots. They also compared chronometric readings, transporting marine chronometers between the stations, to determine the variation in the respective clocks. Indeed, Airy put a good deal of weight on the comparison with the German station, 
because the German station was the best of those at Kurgelen connected to the growing global telegraph network. Only five days prior to the Germans' first observation at Kurgelen, they had been observing and calibrating their clocks at Luxor. Their swift trip made their chronographs readings reliable, and the baseline measurements at Luxor were extremely reliable, being connected as it was by telegraph to Cairo, and from there to Alexandria, and ultimately all the way back to the sidereal clock at Greenwich. The determination of longitude via telegraph had been proved extremely effective since the Americans began using this technique in overland measurements in the 1840s. The end result is that the German observers in Kurgelen ended up being knit into the British system for error reduction. The German boat, the Gazelle, played a role analogous to that of the British ship Shearwater for its expedition to Rodriguez. The Shearwater expedition, financed by Lord Lindsay, was gratuitously equipped with 42 marine chronometers, and it took advantage of the telegraphic connections in Egypt as well. Lindsay's expedition, after determining the longitude of Suez in part through telegraphic connection with Cairo, sailed to Mauritius, then Rodriguez, and finally to Aden, where it closed the loop through telegraphic connection with Suez. But in Mauritius, the Shearwater made contact with the Rodriguez party, and the two parties effectively combined in the trip to Rodriguez, with the officers from Lindsay's expedition helping the other crew enormously to establish trigonometric and gunpowder signal connections between stations and chronometric connections to Mauritius. I should say that it is unclear to me just how fortuitous this collaboration was. Airy presents it this way, but his assistant George Forbes, in the May 1874 issue of Nature, suggests that the connection was planned. This difference in perception could have something to do with the fact that Airy was an inveterate micromanager and found himself in the position of necessarily ceding decision-making power to his teams. For all the attention paid by scholars like Bernard Lightman to Airy's hierarchical, militaristic modes of institutional organization, we should also recognize the unavoidable delegation of authority that comes with shipping independent expeditions far overseas and demanding very precise results from them. At Kurgelen, the situation was sufficiently fluid for the observers on the ground to have to make local determinations about procedure that would have large consequences for the entire project, such as, for instance, the decision to cancel the Possession Island expedition. In the case of Rodriguez, this only meant using British assets, but in the case of Kurgelen, it meant collaborating in very practical and necessarily unpredictable ways with teams of other nations. But complexity and the decentralization of authority are not transcendent goods, a point that can be easy to miss the denser, more interconnected, and more organic a network begins to look. Whether or not the forms of social organization that attend institutional, technology-driven science are used to immediately extract events, these high-precision surveys opened up the territories they passed through, and indirectly all territories marginally more, to the emergent global market. And when Aries' observational team in Hawaii attempted to accurately connect the Honolulu station to the global network, they went not west, but east, to San Francisco, which had been connected longitudinally via telegraph connection across the American-occupied Midwest, and from Duxbury, Massachusetts, to Greenwich via the transatlantic cable, both in 1869. The Hawaiian expedition presented an opportunity to perform the necessary preliminary work of bringing the Pacific into Britain's emergent global network of communications and commerce. Airy's necessary delegation of authority to his expeditionary teams, then, served the purpose of making the project's work more permanent, because it made the global communications network less fragile. We've already seen how the Egyptian expedition worked hand-in-glove with the project of increasing the accuracy of connections down the eastern coast of Africa and on the Arabian Peninsula. In Hawaii, two old observatories were relocated and brought back into service. Both the Hawaiian and Egyptian expeditions were heavily fortified against the local populations. When we hold up side by side Aries' establishment of protocols with Proctor's violation of them, we see that Airy and Proctor have very different ideas of what self-critique looks like. Airy, the experienced manager of human capital, social capital, and high-tech equipment, understands the goal of self-critique to be the elimination of error. And from this position, as the head of this revered institution, he appears to have conflated consensus with truth. As the head of the Royal Astronomical Society, dissent of the sort that Proctor offered is, in fact, 
a problem to be solved. But from Proctor's point of view, self-critique is the means by which institutions and people change their practices. For Proctor, the central problem is Aries' inability to respond appropriately to his criticisms. Both of these astronomers are invested in the RAS as an institution. But where Aries is resistant to the critique of institutional protocols, Proctor is willing to embarrass the institution on the national and the international stages in order to precipitate reforms. And yet, in the end, he was an institutionalist, however personally stung. Whatever justification my researches and appeals may have seemed to require has been afforded by the unanimous vote of the leading British astronomers assembled at the Greenwich Board of Visitation. In fine, I apprehend that in after years it will be thought worthier to have indicated, even if ineffectually, the proper course than to have adopted effectual measures to prevent the proper course from being carried out.